Okay, is it okay? Is there any way I can get the lapel? Yeah, yeah. Do you have the lapel? Oh, okay, you're getting the lapel. Okay, it's just easier for me because I like to move my hands and throw around. But while he's getting that done, I've got a few books here that I just want to give away. I always try to give something to give away. I'm constantly giving, constantly sowing, constantly looking for people to bless. And because the quickest way to my destiny is to help somebody else get to their destiny. Amen? Amen. How many know it's not about you, it's about her? And it's not about her, it's about you. And it's not about you, it's about pastor. It's not about pastor, it's about me. But it's not about me, it's about him. It's about others. Amen? Amen. But all, a lot of Christians, especially in America, they say, well, what about me? What about me? When is it my turn? It's not about you. It's not about you. There's a whole world out there dying and going to a godless eternity until they hear the name of Jesus. And a lot of people ask me a lot of questions of why I go to the places that I go. And I tell my American brothers and sisters in Christ this. Why do you get to hear the name of Jesus 10,000 times? When there are people that have never heard the name of Jesus one time. Did you hear that? Okay, folks, we're at church. It's Sunday morning. Some of you look like you're dead. Some of you look like a statue. We're supposed to be excited. We are in the house of God. Our name is written in the book of life. Amen? Amen. When you get to heaven, you are not going to be sitting like this. You're going to be dancing before the Lord. You're going to be shouting. You're going to be screaming. You're going to be on your face worshiping the most high God. Amen? Amen? Isn't it amazing? You know, the World Cup is coming. And boy, when they kick that little ball. When they kick that little ball inside of a net. Time out here. Oh, you're good. You're good. That's okay. I should have done this before. My bad. They kicked that. They kicked that little ball, little ball, through a net, and everybody goes crazy. In football, they're running and they cross a white line, and the place erupts and goes crazy. In basketball, they take a little ball and put it in a little basket, and everybody goes crazy. In baseball, they hit a ball over the fence, and everybody goes crazy. And then we come to church, and we're like this. Isn't that amazing? Why is that? My Bible says David danced before the Lord. He danced before the Lord so much with almost no clothes on. His wife got mad and jealous and angry, and she remained barren for the rest of her life. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Spirit. My first trip to India on my way home on the airport, there was a gentleman sitting right next to me. He'd been going to India for 35 years. 35 years was my first trip. And on my way home, he sat next to me. Oh, boy, did God set that one up. I told him 23,000 Hindus came to the Lord in one altar call. I said there was miracles everywhere. He says, I don't believe in miracles. God doesn't do miracles anymore. He goes, I bet you believe in Oral Roberts. I said, no, I actually don't believe in Oral Roberts. I believe in the God that called Oral Roberts. Well, I just... He goes, I bet you believe in that praying in tongues, too. I said, And he got so angry. He said, for 35 years, I've been coming to India and preaching in Bible colleges, preaching against speaking in tongues. I said, really? For 15 hours, I sat next to him and prayed in tongues. And he got so angry. So angry. You know the sad thing about it is? It says in 1 Corinthians that when that day comes that our works are tested by fire. In that day, capital D, when all of this
this is done, we're going to stand before the Lord. And everything that we've done on a personal basis for the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be tested by fire. Wood, hay, stubble, all that stuff's going to burn. The only thing that's going to last is the gold, the precious metals of what we did for the Lord. And for 35 years, that guy was going and preaching against the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When that day comes and he stands before the Lord, his works are going to burn. Burn. Thank God Jesus is his Savior. He will be saved. But he'll lose his reward. That's why he says, by your words you'll be justified and by your words you'll be condemned. He's not talking about what you're talking about at Starbucks or what you're talking about in your living room. What he's talking about, by your words you'll be justified, by your words you'll be condemned. When you say that healing is not for today, when you say praying in tongues is not for today, when you say the gifts of the Spirit is not for today, when you say the fivefold is not for today, that's what he's talking about. You can't just go off and say anything you want. You and I and Pastor We'll give an account one day. All of us will give an account. All of us. Nobody's getting away with anything. Amen? Uh, the Bible says in Hebrews, it's a scary thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Remember the Apostle John? He used to sleep on Jesus' chest. And he used to look at the Lord and say, I love you, I love you, I love you. When Jesus walked on the earth, the twelve apostles and Paul just did another, or excuse me, John laid on his chest. <laughs> in the book of Revelation, when John saw Jesus in his glorified body, he couldn't even stand up. He was on the ground, flat on his face, because of the glory of the Lord. If Jesus walked through that wall right now in all of his glory, not one of us would be sitting there like this. We'd be on the floor with our face smashed on the ground saying, Have mercy on me, Jesus. Oh, my God, have mercy on me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Be strong in the Lord. Who wants this? There you go. Don't be offended. Don't be offended. There you go. There's one for you. Finding your purpose. Finding your purpose. There you go. Be blessed. How to turn your scars into stars. There you go, bud. This new life. This new life. There you go. Whoa, sorry, buddy. Hit you in the head. I have to pray for healing. All right. Healing, help, and hope. There you go. Good catch, kind of. Oh, the overflow room. Ah, that's what you get for getting here late. You have to sit in the overflow room. Lost and restored. There you go, bud. It's time to drive out your enemies. There you go. Taking control of your thoughts. Oh, you need that because your brain is crazy. <laughs> Recovering what the devil has stolen. There you go. Diligence produces results. There you go. Possessing God's promises. That one's for Pastor. <laughs> I just gave him a stack of books like that. I take books. I love books and see... I didn't bring any of my stuff because I did not know what to expect. So next time when I come, I'm going to bring a bunch of stuff that make available to you. I have tons and tons of teaching. The warnings of God. The warnings of God. There you go. Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Ooh. And last one, overcoming strife. Ooh, I like this. The AIDS virus of the spirit. Uh, okay. All right. My bald black friend back here. There you go, bud. Be blessed. All right, are you guys ready for God's Word? Yes. Amen, amen. Open your Bibles, and for the guy that's putting the stuff up here, you're going to want to go to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you so hungry for what men cannot give us. We're tired of creeds, tradition, and doctrines of men. We desire your pure and undefiled access into your best. So come, Holy Spirit, and teach us. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to receive what the Spirit of the living God is doing in these last days in the great nation of Qatar.
and the nations of the earth. Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us. Without you, Lord, we can do nothing. We don't want just our talents. We don't want just our personality. We don't just want our gift. We want your presence. Because in your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, there is healing. In your presence, there is prosperity. In your presence, there is deliverance and salvation and holiness. And we are ever so careful to give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Okay. Now, what I'm going to teach and preach on today... It takes like 10 hours of teaching, and I'm going to give it to you in an hour. So I'm going to hit the big points, okay? But it's, it's about 10 hours of teaching on Luke chapter 6. I preached this sermon in Damascus, Syria, with the believers in Syria. How many knows when you read the Old Testament, it says, Syria went to war with Israel. Israel went to war with Syria. Syria went to war with Israel. Israel went to war with Syria. Syria went to war with Israel. They hate each other. They can't stand each other. By the time I was done preaching and teaching this, all of us in Syria faced Israel and we began to pray for the Israelis. And the presence of God came down and touched the hearts of the Syrian believers where there was offense where there was bitterness, where there was strife, where there was hatred, where there was prejudice. Listen, I know the regime. I know what you guys live under here. I spent a lot of time in the Middle East. I know some of your bosses are not the nicest people. I know some of the rich Qatarians might not be the nicest people. But after today, I think you might change a little bit. You might change a little bit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Can you put up Luke 6.38? Pastor, do you guys have Christian television here? Not really? Okay. So, some of you might not understand this, so let me just give you a little education, a little brief education from America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, the Western countries, if I can say that, okay? None of us are better than anybody. I just happened to be born in California. I had no control over it. Mom and Dad came together. Out came Jason in California. All right? Mom and Dad came together. You guys came into Uganda. Most of you from India. We had no choice. That's just the way God set it up. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall be men put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, since most of you are have, have not really have Christian television, this scripture right here is the most abused scripture in all of Christianity. All of Christianity. You can turn on Christian television all over the world and the preacher will get up and he will do a little shaking and dancing and what he's after? Your money. It's after your money. Oh, he might be a good guy. Give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shake it together. Running over shall men pour into your bosom. So when you give, God will give back to you and they excite your emotions to give. The motive of the heart is not correct. Why? Because he took that scripture out of context. He is not talking about money and I'm going to prove it to you. This is the most abused scripture. The most, in all of the Bible, taken completely out of context. He is not even talking about money. That's why when I go to a church or whatever, and they're taking the offering. 
Give and it shall be given unto you. If you give to God, God will give to you. If you let go of what's in your hand, God will let go of what's in His hand. Really? How many of you have children in here? Okay, my son Judah walks up to me. He needs five bucks for lunch. Do I say to him, Judah, give me three dollars and I'll give you five dollars? No! I give it to my son. Why? Because he's my son. And I love him. He doesn't have to give me anything. I simply, by grace, because he is my son, I freely give to him. Amen? Amen. People say, if you don't give to God, he won't give to you. I beg your pardon? He is not like that. He is my father. I am his son. I don't have to ask him permission to go into the refrigerator and eat. He simply says, you're my son. Partake. Amen? Amen. For you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich for your sakes, he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made what? Rich. If you back up in those chap in that chapter, the word grace is used four times. So when it comes to the prosperity of God, the grace of God is really involved. Now, do I believe in seed time and harvest? Of course. Genesis says, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night, it will not cease. I believe in sowing. I believe in giving. But I don't give to move God. He's not stuck. He's not stuck. He's not talking about money here, and I'm going to prove it to you. Because you can go to church after church all over America, and when they take the offering, whether it's the Sunday morning tithes and offerings, or whether it's a midweek service, 99% of the time, the guys will be up there and on television, and say, give, and it shall be given unto you. <laughs> and I'm like, I put my money back in my pocket. <laughs> I'm not giving to you. You're a knucklehead. You just took that scripture right out of contest. You do not know what you're talking about. Why? Because when people cannot get their money from God, they have to get it from people. That hurts. They can't get it from God, so they got to get it to people. So they got to excite your emotions to give. Listen, giving is an instruction of grace. You should give because you love people and you want to sow so the gospel goes out all over the world. Don't worry, God's going to take care of your needs and if you want something, there's nothing wrong with it. As long as that stuff doesn't have your heart, God will give it to you. God doesn't care if you drive a Porsche or if you take the bus. He doesn't mind if you live in a million dollar home or if you rent an apartment. That stuff just can't have your heart. Money is not evil. It's the love of money that is evil. Money is a tool to get the gospel out. God doesn't mind if you go buy a nice car. But if you're going out on your car on Sunday morning and not coming or Friday morning and not coming to church, God's got a problem. If you want to get a boat, God doesn't mind you getting a boat. As long as Friday morning when it comes, you're not out on your boat. You're here in the house of God. He don't mind. Amen? Amen. So are you ready for God's word? Hang on tight with me. How many of you know the confession of God's word? Confession. Everybody know confession? Yeah. Let me give you an example. You need uh, money for rent. You need money for a new car. You need money to go see your family back in India. And you don't have it. So you start confessing God's word. My God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. I thank you, Father God, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. That's confession of God's word. Okay? That's first level. That's Christianity 101. We confess the words that you speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Nothing wrong with it. I do it all the time. All the time. But then there's a higher one. It's the meditation of God's word. Blessed is the man, blessed is the woman who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands on the path of sinners, sits in the seat of the scornful. What? His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates Monday, Wednesday, and Friday? Yeah. Yeah. Only Friday morning at church? Yeah. Day and night. Day and night. And 
because you meditate day and night, you shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever you touch shall prosper. So there's confession of God's word, then there's meditation of God's word. But meditation is not memorization, because you cannot memorize day and night. Meditation is not studying God's word, because you cannot study day and night. Solomon says that much study is wearisome to the flesh. Meditation is that unique way that the Holy Spirit gets involved with my human spirit to take the counsel in the, the, the heart of the God in the form of the Word and reconstruct that counsel so it becomes the wisdom, the revelation, and the knowledge that I need to walk out this life of what He's called me to do. So there's confession of God's Word. Then there's meditation of God's Word. But we can go even higher. It's called assimilation of God's Word. What does assimilation mean? Let me give you an example. How many of you are Indian? Okay, how many speak Hindi? How many speak Telugu? Anybody speak Urdu? Anybody speak Tamil? Okay, so, since I've been to Tamil Nadu many, many times, the worst way for me to learn Tamil, or Hindi, or Telugu, or Urdu, or Spanish, or Russian, doesn't matter which language it is, the worst way, the slowest way, the hardest way, is for me to get my, my earphones, and just kind of listen to, how do you say stop in your language? In Malala. Nirto. Okay? Nirto. Stop. Nirto. Stop. Nirto. Stop. That's the worst way that you can learn that language. Why? Because I'm only using one attribute of my soul. My intellect. But your soul is made up of four attributes. Your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. So when I say, irto, stop, irto, stop, irto, stop, that is the worst way to learn a language. Because I'm only using the one attribute of my soul, which is my intellect. The best way to learn this is to go into a city in India where nobody speaks English. All they do is speak that language. So I go in there, I'm American, I only speak English. I don't know his language in that village. But guess what? After six months, I will know that language. Why? Because now I'm using all four of the attributes of my soul. My mind, my will, my intellect, and my emotions. I begin to assimilate the culture. That's the best way to learn. If you don't know English, the best thing, the way to learn is come to America where nobody speaks your language. And all of a sudden you are constantly hearing. That's why a child, when they grow up, they know the language. Why? Because they're using all the attributes of your soul. Confession, meditation, assimilation, and then there's one more. Meditation by assimilation. So, how do you... Assimilate chapters of the Bible. See, I know preachers, they take notes to understand Bible verses. But guess what? God gave us Bible verses to understand the chapters. Did you hear what I said? People take notes to understand Bible verses, but God gave us Bible verses so we could understand whole chapters. That's why when you take Luke 6.38 and preach out of that one scripture, you're most likely going to take it out of context. That's not what Jesus was talking about. So you begin to confess God's word, meditate on God's word, assimilate. How do you assimilate? You take Luke chapter 6 and you read it 50 times. You don't go to the Greek. You don't go to the Hebrew. You just read it over, over so your mind can understand it. Your mind can understand it. You read it once. Then you read it twice. Then you read it 30 times. Then you read it 40 times. All of a sudden, you will begin to find out that this verse is connected to this verse, is connected to this verse, is connected to this verse, and is connected to this verse, so you understand the revelation of what God's trying to say. How many know we have a seed? We plant the seed, and a tree grows, right? But when we take a verse out of context, we break the seed in half, you destroy it. 
So when you go and teach, give and it shall be given unto you. Oh, if you give to God in the offering, God will give back to you. You just destroyed the seed. Because that's not what he's talking about. You just took that verse out of context. You begin to assimilate whole chapters. And all of a sudden you're like, Phew, and you understand what he's talking about. Meditation. Through the imagery of words. If I was to paint this pulpit right here, paint this pulpit, every stroke of the brush was a verse of Scripture. That by the time this verse, and that verse, and this verse, and that verse, and this verse, and that verse, by the time I got down to here, you would be able to see that it's a pulpit. But let's just say I grabbed this little plastic piece out of here, and I started teaching on that little plastic piece. You wouldn't know it's a pulpit. Would you? You'd say it's a little piece of plastic. No, because every verse is built on another verse coming to the sum total of the revelation of the seed of what God is trying to get over to you. Do you understand? See, I need like eight hours to teach this stuff, but I'm giving it to you real quick. So now let's go find out what God's talking about in Luke chapter 6. Start with me in verse 46, 47, 48, and 49. Hang on with me, because I'm going to go real quick through this. All right? <clears throat> but why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Stop right there. Isn't this interesting? He's talking to the 12. Don't, don't change it up there, but let me go back here to the 20th verse. The Bible says, Then he lifted up his eyes towards his disciples and said, All of Luke chapter 6. But this is the end of Luke chapter 6. Now, he didn't say, why do you call me Lord and do not do the things that I say? He said, why do you call me Lord, Lord? Meaning, he's trying to get something over to us. Do you know what that means? The 12 disciples <laughs> were not doing what Jesus said to do. Sound familiar? Any of us ever been there? Come on, let's be honest. How many of you, I remember back in my Bible college days, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. And he said, clean the bathrooms and vacuum the church. I find that Satan. I'll go to the nations in Jesus' name. I want to go to the nations. I'm called to preach. Da -da -da -da. Humble yourself and serve. I bind you again, devil, in Jesus' name. I'm called to... Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And do not do the things that I say. So that means the twelve dysfunctional, jacked up, messed up apostles and disciples were not doing what Jesus said. Peter was a cusser. John was a crybaby. Judas was a thief. Matthew was a greedy tax collector. Twelve messed up individuals. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord? Lord, and do not do the things that I say. Next verse. Whoever comes to the ministry, whoever comes to New Life Fellowship, Whoever comes to prosperity, no. Whoever comes to the family, whoever comes to the big churches in America, no. He said, whoever comes to who? Me. Me. Isn't that interesting? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, uh-oh, here we go. Not only being a hearer of the word, James says, but a doer of the word who hears my sayings and then begins to implement them in their everyday life. Let me tell you something, church. If you open your Bible one day a week and all you do is worship God when you come in or on Sunday, you are not going to make it in these last days. He's got to be first in your life. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. You've got to be in His Word. You've got to have private prayer time. You've got to be worshiping God. If you've got to get up at 3 in the morning, then you better get up at 3 in the morning. If you go to New York in America and you go to Wall Street, those guys that are, have the love of money and full of greed, those guys are up at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning looking at the markets, trying to feel how they can fill their treasuries, and us Christians can't even get out of bed to pray. And we expect God to move and revival to come. It's not going to happen. When you hear His Word, man, you've got to take it and use it in your family, your business, your job, your entrepreneurship with your boss, when you're at the beach, when you're on vacation. Amen. The disciples weren't doing it. 
They were hearing Jesus, but they weren't doing it. Isn't that encouraging for you and I? That the twelve were messed up too? Why do you think God calls us sheep? Have you ever seen a sheep? They're the stupidest animal on the planet. I was in New Zealand. 3.5 million people, 75 million sheep. And I was out on the farm of the pastor. And there was one little small hole in the fence. And there was a hundred sheep. And you know what they did? They wanted to go through that hole. You know what they did? They sat there and just looked at the hole. <laughs> Stupid! And guess what happened? One went for the hole to get through the hole. But not only one, when the first guy went, all hundred tried to go through the hole at the same time. And they kept hitting it and hitting it. And they'd back up and then they would go through it and they would hit it again. And then they would go through and they would hit it again. And they would go through and they would hit it again. What does that mean? Sheep are stupid. He calls us sheep. <laughs> Not only you, me too, Pastor too. <laughs> you, get the, you know the two most stupid sheep in this place is me and him. Why? Because God's called us to the ministry. Oh my God. If you're not called to the ministry, do not go in the ministry. You will go crazy. Majnuni. <laughs> so my friends in the Middle East call me. Majnuni, crazy man. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, do not do the things that I say? Whoever comes to me, hears my sayings and does them, I will show you who is like. Then we're going to see two types of Christians. Next verse. He was like a man building a house. Okay? we got a house here. Dug deep, laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose, when the stream beat vehemently against the house, it could not shake it for it was founded on the rock. So let's break this down a little bit. He says, this is the guy who hears the word and then begins to implement it in his everyday life. This is who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation. This house goes down and there's a foundation. All those big high-rise buildings over there, before that sucker goes up, it goes way down. But guess what? It says you build the foundation 